I'm Caroline Uhler, a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, and a core faculty member at the Broad Institute, one of the world's leading biomedical research centers. At the Broad, I co-direct the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center, which seeks to create a two-way street between machine learning and biology. And I'm Nir Hakon. I'm the director of the MGH Center for Cancer Immunology and the director of the Cell Circuits here at the Broad Institute. And we want to share with you today an exciting challenge taking place this January. The Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center is holding the Cancer Immunotherapy Data Science Challenge through Top Coder in collaboration with Harvard's Laboratory for Innovation Science, MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Gordian Biotechnology, and the Mass General Cancer Center. Today, we're here to talk about why we're doing this challenge and also to discuss the problems at hand. We'll talk about cancer immunotherapy using our own immune system to combat tumors, exciting new biological data sets that could open novel avenues for cancer immunotherapy, and why we think machine learning is the key to unlocking the power of these data. We'll also get into the challenge itself. Can you design algorithms that identify genetic modifications of T cells that make them effective at killing cancer cells? Now, for some of our viewers, we know it's been a while since biology class in high school or college. So Nir, let's talk about T-cells. Okay. Well, T-cells are the soldiers of the immune system. Every time we're sick, say with a virus, our immune system mounts a response. T-cells find, attack, and destroy the cell that harbors the virus. As a result, we get better. They also find and destroy cancer cells, at least some of the time. But one of the hallmarks of cancer that we now understand that the cancer cells are very skilled at evading detection by the immune system. Cancer cells mimic our own healthy cells and send signals that cause the T cells to malfunction. Right, and when that happens, the cancer cells can start to multiply out of control, forming lumps called tumors. Mm -hmm. And these cancer cells can also spread to other parts of the body through a process called metastasis. And on top of that, cancer is not just one disease. Melanoma is very different from leukemia, which is very different from breast cancer. Exactly. What we know now is that our genetic mutations actually influence how well we respond to particular kinds of treatment, even for the same cancer. In other words, one treatment for one patient won't necessarily work for everyone else. But there is hope. We believe that the future for cancer care is immunotherapy. Cancer immunotherapy uses our body's immune system to fight cancer by boosting or changing how the immune system works so that it can better find and attack cancer cells. Yeah, and immunotherapy has already shown results and holds even more promises. If we can make the T cells attack tumors even more potently than now, then we can eliminate any form of cancer in any part of the body. That would be an enormous improvement over current treatments. But you might be thinking, this is quite a feat where do we even start? How do we make immunotherapy scalable and effective? So this is where large-scale data sets and machine learning really come in. Mm -hmm. The life sciences are in the midst of a data revolution, where inexpensive and accurate DNA sequencing is a reality, advanced molecular imaging is becoming routine, and single-cell genomics is allowing us to profile millions of cells in a single experiment. These innovations and the massive data sets they produce have brought us really to a threshold of a new era in biomedicine. However, with this opportunity also comes a challenge. Our ability to generate data is rapidly outpacing our ability to analyze and interpret it. To give you a better idea, a single lab can generate a data set that rivals in size the entire movie library of Netflix. Here at the Broad, we have more than 100 petabytes of data under management, which is 100 million gigabytes. Put simply, we have reached the limits of unaided human comprehension. But fortunately, the last two decades have witnessed not only a transformation of the life sciences, but also the data sciences. As we all know, we're living in the golden age of AI and machine learning. But unlike in the more traditional applications of machine learning and AI, like recommender systems or online advertising, in the biomedical sciences, the ultimate goal is often to understand the underlying mechanisms. 
For example, in our Cancer Immunotherapy Data Science Challenge, we need to understand the underlying regulatory circuit of T-cells in order to identify modifications that will make the cells more effective at killing cancer cells. So the causal aspect is really important for this application, and we will talk more about this later. But before that, Nir, let's talk a little bit more about immunotherapy and also our heroes, the T-cells. So the idea of cancer immunotherapy has actually been around since the late 1800s. Initial immunotherapy efforts sought to use bacteria or viruses to mount an immune response against the cancer. Today, there are two main categories of cancer immunotherapy treatment, which both involve T-cells, checkpoint therapy and CAR-T therapy. The checkpoint proteins, which are on the surface of T-cells, are one of the ways that our immune system self-regulates. When checkpoint proteins bind to healthy cells, they send a signal to the T-cell to turn off. But they also switch off when T-cells bind to cancer cells. Checkpoint therapies, like the therapy developed for advanced melanoma, block the off signal for T-cells and tumors, allowing them to kill cancer cells. In CAR-T therapy, on the other hand, researchers actually remove a cancer patient's T-cells from their body re-engineer the cells to make them target cancer cells and put them back into the patient. CAR-T therapy is only approved for a limited number of cancers like certain kinds of leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. To better understand how immunotherapy works, let's take a closer look at T-cells. We're gonna use these pokeballs to demonstrate the T-cells. T-cells start as what we call naive T-cells who have not yet seen their target. Each naive T-cell in your body has on its surface a slightly different recognition receptor, which is created through an amazing process of random rearrangement of gene sequences to make the T-cell receptor, or what we call the TCR. The TCR recognizes specific molecules presented on the surface of the cancer cell, represented here in the melanoma. When the T-cell receptor first sees its target on a cancer cell, the T-cells become activated and move through a series of transformations. So from a naive T-cell, the cell becomes activated and forms what's called a progenitor T-cell state. This T-cell state has the ability to produce many more T-cells and more of itself, so it's self-renewing. In the second stage, it becomes an effector T-cell, and the effector T-cell can divide fast and kill tumor cells, so it recognizes the tumor cells and kills them. In the third stage, the T-cell enters what we call a terminal exhausted state. This state has reduced functionality and proliferation and a shorter lifetime. So it can kill the tumor a little bit, but eventually it dies. In addition, there's a fourth state of cells that are currently in the process of dividing. These cells are known as cycling cells, and any of the cell states we just talked about can be in this uh, proliferating state to make more cells to, to kill the tumor. Now you may be asking, why do we even have terminal exhausted states for T cells? It's because we all have chronic viruses that are controlled by our T cells throughout our life. But these T cells cannot work at full force. Oh, they're gonna cause more damage to the bodies and the viruses that they actually protect against. So at a high level, the activated T cells can be in four different states. A progenitor state where they can proliferate, a cycling state of cells that are in the process of dividing, an effector state where they can kill tumor cells, and an exhausted state, which is in fact the dominant type in human cancers. The goal of this challenge is to identify genetic modifications that increase the probability of these T cells going into the progenitor, cycling, or effector states. But what defines a T cell state? Well, humans and mice have about 20,000 genes. And one way of characterizing the state of a T cell or any cell is by measuring the activity of each of these genes in a cell. With today's single cell technologies, these measurements can be done at a scale of hundreds of thousands of cells per experiment. So this means that every cell is represented as a 20,000 dimensional vector. And then by performing clustering, we can identify the cells that are in each one of the states. So the progenitor state, the effector state, the exhausted state, and the cycling state. So let's now shift and talk about how can we change the state of the T-cell. So the state of a T-cell is defined by the underlying gene regulatory circuitry. Changing a single gene in this circuitry can dramatically impact the expression of tens to hundreds of genes, and through that shift the T-cell from one state into another. 
Now, gene editing technologies like CRISPR allow us to actually go in and, for example, remove a gene, which is called a knockout. Note that by changing one gene, you may change the activity of many other genes, namely the ones that are downstream from the modified gene in the regulatory circuit. So by cleverly identifying which gene to modify, we should be able to move T cells from one state to another and reduce the probability of generating these exhausted T cells. Exactly. But the problem is, for us, is that there's approximately 20,000 individual gene modifications or perturbations that we could make to a single T cell, and 400 million combinations of these perturbations. Testing all these possibilities would be unbelievably time-consuming and expensive. So the question here is, how can we narrow down the 20,000 possibilities to just those few perturbations that are most likely to work to reach our goal? So this is where you and your algorithms come in to our data science challenge to reprogram T cells to combat cancer. And to make this happen, we've collected a very large single cell data set from tumors in mice, where we measured the activity of every gene in 100,000 T cells. We've also knocked out 70 different genes, one gene knockout per cell. So that means we can see how removing one of those genes affects the activity of all the other genes, and that can give us insights into the underlying gene regulatory circuit of a T cell. But of course, we've only performed 70 knockouts out of all these possible 20,000 knockouts. But now, given this training data set, the challenge is to design algorithms that can predict the effect of all these other unseen possible knockouts and identify the ones that would lead to a higher proportion of cells in the progenitor state, the effector state, and the cycling state, and less cells in this exhausted state. So here is the exact breakdown of the challenge. In part one, you will predict the effect of knockouts that have already been studied in the lab. This will allow you to see how well your algorithms work. In part two, you will propose new knockouts that based on your algorithms could boost the cell's ability to destroy the tumor. And then finally, in part three, you will come up with a metric for ranking how well a particular gene knockout would shift T cells to a desired state. And so we're really excited to announce something unique to this challenge. The top scores from part one will have their submissions experimentally validated in the lab. So you can get to see how well your algorithms actually perform in controlling tumors and eliminating them. Note that a biology background isn't needed to participate. The Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center will provide all challenge participants with a short online crash course. And the Broad Institute is a global leader in biomedical research, in particular in genetic sequencing. So this is a unique opportunity to learn from leading life science and computational biology experts. And the crash course will take you through the biology of the immune system, explaining the function of T cells in a tumor. You'll also learn more about the technology that we use to generate the single cell transcriptomics and the perturb seq data sets that you'll be working with. And the crash course will give you an introduction to the biases of these type of data and how to work with the data. You'll be well prepped for the challenge at hand. The challenge will run from January 9 to February 3, 2023. You can sign up as an individual or a team and we'll be giving out monetary prizes to the winners of each part of the challenge, totaling 50,000 US dollars. And the top participants will be invited to become an author on the resulting publications. Another great product of this challenge is that the resulting data, algorithms, and code from the challenge will all be made open source for the community to use. And we will also be adding to these perturbational data sets as new experiments become available. And we would love for you to remain engaged in this problem also after the completion of this particular challenge. To achieve the goals that we just talked about, we're going to need new ideas. New ideas that break through the bounds of the traditional approaches, that address the most pressing questions, and ultimately help us intersect machine learning with biology. So not only will you get to do something you love, but your algorithms could change the course of how we treat cancer. If you haven't already, register now, and we're very excited to be working with you.